Hello and welcome to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast, where each week, Pastor Jeff Cranston explores biblical theology that provides practical life applications in an understandable way. Thanks for joining us at the table. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Tiffany Coker, along with my dad, Pastor Jeff Cranston. We're seeking not only to help you know deep, solid biblical theology, but to know the Word of God and the promises of God that are given to us in His Word, all while holding to solid theological truths in your heart, soul, and mind. We're going to go ahead and dive right in today with the Old Testament book of Ezra. Dad, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. And hello again, Kitchen Table Theologians. As we begin today, I've got a quick question for you. So, Tiff, maybe you can answer this, And but Kitchen Table Theologian, I want you to think about this as well. What did you want to be when you grew up? When you were a little kid, everybody's always asking you how old you are, and then they're always asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? How did did you answer that? When you, Tiff, when you were a little girl, what did you think about being when you were growing up or when you would be all grown up? I think I have a few memories when I was really little of dreaming of being an Olympic athlete. And I probably thought I could be a figure skater or I remember the 1996 Olympic gymnastic team loved them. I knew I could never be a gymnast, but I think just as a, when I was really young, I remember dreaming about being an Olympic athlete. But then once I got to middle school, high school, and maybe a little bit more of a reality, I wanted to be a teacher when I grew up. And I did did. that for a few years. Yes, I did. But I've asked my kids this recently too. So I have three kids. My oldest is a girl. She wants to be a counselor when she grows up. She recently met Sissy Goff and she dreams of being her when she grows up one day, (laughs) able to help other little girls. So that's kind of cool. My boys want to play baseball and coach baseball. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I could have guessed that one. Yeah, (laughs) for sure. Gade wants to coach in the major league, the MLB. and. Colt, you could guess this too. Where does he want to coach one day? I don't even, I'm not saying it on my own <laughs> podcast. You know it. He wants to play and coach for Auburn. Yeah. But we're, anyways. <laughs> he's, we're, I don't know what we're going to do with that boy. We got to work on him. But no, let's get back to Ezra. That was fun for a minute. You'll have to explain to us why you're asking us what we want to be when we grow up. And maybe sort of explain that for us. Also tell us a little bit about who wrote the book. I'm guessing that is a pretty self-evident answer in that the book is titled Ezra. But tell us why you're asking us this question first, and then we'll dive into Ezra. Well, you know, it's not as majorly important as you may think it is why I asked that question. (laughs) But no matter what we wanted to be when we were little, and for me, it was to be a baseball player or a firefighter paramedic. That's what I wanted to do, or I thought I did. But no matter what we wanted to be, no matter what we find ourselves doing right now, most of us have grown up. And I say most of us because we know that there are some young people who listen to Kitchen Table Theology. So if you're all grown up now, no matter what you want to be or what you do now, good reminder to us is God can use us in powerful ways. So today we meet Ezra, and he was a Jewish priest and scribe. Is just a fancy word for being a writer. And so, yeah, God used a writer in a very significant way in the history of Israel. So you would think God would only use guys like David or Moses or Abraham. Mm -hmm. But here we have an example of God using a writer. Now, Jewish uh, tradition has always attributed authorship of this book to Ezra not only a a priest and a scribe, but also a scholar. And Ezra was one of the guys who led the second group of Jews returning from Babylon to Jerusalem. And we learn about that in Ezra chapter 7. Ezra 8, it's very interesting. He goes from third person, talking in the third person, to talking in the first person, implying that he was participating in these events. He just wasn't chronicling the events. He was a participant in the events. And there's a switch there between chapter 7 and chapter 8. So Ezra played a major role in the second half of the book of Ezra. And we also see him in the book of Nehemiah, which is a sequel to Ezra. So you, you may recall from recent podcasts, Ezra is believed by many to possibly be the author of 
what we know as First and Second Chronicles. And that would make more sense when you consider that it would have been natural for the same author to continue the Old Testament narrative by showing how God fulfilled his promise by returning his people to the promised land after being in captivity for 70 years. There's also, as you read through, a strong priestly tone in Chronicles, and Ezra was a priest and a priestly descendant of Aaron, who was one of the chief priests in Israel. And Ezra being a priest, it would make sense that the writings would take on a priestly tone. So all that to say Ezra is the author. Awesome. That was a lot to digest, but lots of good info there for us. All right. How about giving us a quick overview of the book to help us just understand the context a little bit more? Sure. The book of Ezra is a continuation of First and Second Chronicles. And if you missed our podcast on those, that's podcast 177 and 179. And this book picks up with the proclamation of the Persian king named Cyrus, who had just conquered Babylon. He gave the Jewish people permission to return to Jerusalem. And over the next 100 years, covered in both Ezra and Nehemiah, they returned, resettled, and worked to rebuild the temple. When the people began returning to Israel and they got there, they found it changed. It was no longer what they had been told or what they, in some cases, maybe would have remembered. The people who would have remembered Jerusalem would have been quite old, but it is possible some remembered. There was no longer a Davidic king. The temple was gone, but God had preserved the site of the temple over the years. And Ezra, as I said, returned with the second round of exiles coming in from Babylon. And many believe he wrote the book while Nehemiah came a few years later and continued the story in his book. So it's commonly believed Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one continuous narrative And some even believe Nehemiah may have been written before Ezra. But regardless of whose account came first, they are both vital to the history of Israel because they both delve into the struggles they faced in coming out of being in exile for 70 years and the lessons they learned during that which was a punishment for their national disobedience. And Ezra, as a book, dives into a number of lessons the Jewish people learned and and that we should learn from as well concerning disobedience to God and the consequences of sin. So that's a lot, but that's that's sort of an overview of of the book. And I know just personally, I'm a lot more familiar with Nehemiah than Ezra. So it's interesting to me that they are maybe more connected than I realized. You mentioned that this book is a historical narrative It's obviously recounting a specific period in the life of Israel. So I'm sure there has to be some main characters here in this book, right? Other than Ezra. Can you tell us briefly about some of the characters? Yeah, we meet some pretty significant people. So besides Ezra, we meet King Cyrus, Zerubbabel, Haggai, Zechariah, Darius, Artaxerxes I. Cyrus was often referred to as Cyrus the Great, and he led the Persian Empire. Zerubbabel was of Davidic origin. He was a Jew, a Babylonian Jew, who returned to Jerusalem, and he was heading one of the bands of exiles that came back, and he became governor of Judea under the Persian regime. And Zerubbabel was very instrumental in leading the rebuilding efforts of the temple. Haggai and Zechariah were Hebrew prophets. We'll learn about an upcoming podcast. Darius was one of the greatest rulers of the Achaemenid dynasty. And he was noted as an administrative genius, and he undertook all these great building projects. He was also known for allowing peoples that he conquered to live where they were and live in peace under his rule. And he ruled in what is now modern-day Iran. And then Artaxerxes I, he was also one of the kings of the Achaemenid Empire, What's interesting about Artaxerxes, this one, there were more than one Artaxerxes, but on this one, Plutarch, the Greek philosopher and historian, refers to him as Artaxerxes, the long-handed, yeah, because allegedly his right hand was longer than his left hand. And so, <laughs> so interesting. apparently that made, a, yeah, that made a big impact on people. And he was known to, for thousands of years, as Artaxerxes, the long-handed. He is described in Ezra 7 as having commissioned Ezra by means of a letter of decree 
to take charge of all of the ecclesiastical or religious and the civil affairs of the Jewish nation. Thank you for not making me say all of those names. <laughs> <laughs> and Kitchen yeah. Table Theologian, if you're looking for your next baby name, I don't know that you should look into the book of Ezra. No, I wouldn't look at Ezra. <laughs> I mean, maybe you could choose Ezra, but other than that, I'd leave it alone. Yeah. <laughs> Some of those were tough. Okay, we touched a little bit, mentioned already on where this book falls in the timeline of Israel's history. But let's dig down a little bit deeper into that for the context of where we are overall in Israel's historical timeline. So where are we on the timeline of in Israel's history? Uh, I'll do my best to make this short and sweet. And it the book kind of divides itself into two sections, okay? Those two sections are two separate time periods, which directly follow the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Now, Kitchen Table Theologian, if you've been staying with us, Going back to First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and First and Second Samuel, we see Israel be overwhelmed and defeated by the Babylonians. They're taken into captivity. They are they were there for seventy years. At the end of the seventy years, this is where we are when we get to Ezra. The seventy years have come and gone. They have been allowed by the Persian dynasty to return to Judea, return to Jerusalem allowed to even rebuild the temple. So I said short and sweet, and I'm not making it short and sweet. Okay, let me try again. <laughs> okay. So the first six chapters of Ezra covers their return, the Jewish return from captivity, and they're led by Zerubbabel. And that's a period of 23 years. Okay, then Ezra 7 through 10, and there's only 10 chapters in this book, 7 through 10 picks up the story more than 60 years later. Okay, so there's a big jump between Ezra 6 and Ezra 7. It jumps 60 years ahead. And when Ezra now, he led the second group of exiles. So Zerubbabel led the first group. Ezra wrote about that sort of as past, and then 7 to 10. Now he leads the second group of exiles, and this is around 458 BC, so about 450 years before the coming of Christ. That kind of puts it in hopefully some historical context. Yes, that's helpful. So some people might call this a rather obscure book of the Old Testament. I mentioned earlier, I know I'm not super familiar with it. You said it only contains 10 chapters, which comparing that to other Old Testament books really is not much at all. Why? Tell us, why is this book so important that it was included in the Bible? Well, it provides a a much needed link in the historical record of the Israeli people. So you go back 70-some years before, the Jewish king is dethroned and captured, and the people are exiled to Babylon. And then you'll remember they even split. They had already split into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And so when all of that happened, Israel as a nation, Judah as a nation, they ceased to exist. There were just people. It's like today. I met a guy in Chicago once who was running a convenience store, and I saw a flag up on the wall, and I'd never seen the flag before. And I asked him what the flag was for, what it represented. And he said the Assyrian people. And it had the it had a red squiggly line, and it had a blue squiggly line, and that represented the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And I said, Syrian people? And he said, no, Assyrian people. So there are still descendants of the Assyrians, but they don't have a country. Now, and, and the Jews found themselves very much in in that same situation. So the book of Ezra gives us an account of their regathering, of their struggle to survive and rebuild what had been destroyed. And through all of that, Ezra's declaring they were still God's people. God had not forgotten them. And just in these 10 chapters, among other things, we as you read it, you, you witness the rebuilding of the new temple the unification of the returning tribes as they shared common struggles and their challenge to work together. And later, after the original remnant under Zerubbabel had stopped work on the city walls, and then spiritual apathy and spiritual drifting was going on again, Ezra arrives with at least another 2,000 people, and all of that sparks a spiritual revival. And by the end of the book, Israel had renewed its covenant with God, 
and was acting in obedience to him. And, and Ezra, just as an aside, Ezra also contains, I think, what is one of the great intercessory prayers of the Bible in, in chapter 9. And Kitchen Table Theologian, definitely worth uh, looking that up today and reading that prayer. And so he was, Ezra was a great leader, and God used him to uh, really advance the, the Jew's spiritual life as a nation. That was a lot. And to fit all of that into 10 chapters, there must be some pretty solid theological themes there. So how about sharing a couple of those with us? Yeah, I'll just share two real quick. There there are many, but overall, I think we can easily see God's providential hand at work in his people. So that's one of God's providential hand at, at work in his people. And, and not only in his people, also in Ezra. And, and as a matter of fact, both Ezra and Nehemiah claim that, quote, the hand of God, end quote, was upon them directing their missions. And that was an oft-repeated phrase, the hand of our God. So this all becomes also becomes a fruitful way to speak of God's grace, since God's hand, as you see it in the book, was usually nudging those around the Jewish community to provide for them in, in caring ways. And it, we're seeing God's providential grace sustaining them through their captivity and then into their freedom. Just as a reminder, grace is that unmerited favor, that unmerited gift of God's love and acceptance. And so providentially, he's working in and through his people. And when he does that, what, what we're seeing there is the grace of God. No surprise. Long time ago, you did a podcast all about grace and God's graciousness. So a kitchen table theologian, if you want to check that out, go all the way back to episode number 24, and you can listen, dive in more about grace, God's grace, God's providential hand. So we see that throughout this book, what other theological themes do we see in Ezra? Maybe one more? Yeah, there's one that I don't think it's heard of, of very often anymore. It used to be more prevalent in the church, but we see this the theme separation. And you're like, what? Yeah, you're going to have to explain that one. <laughs> yeah, I, it's important though. So both Zerubbabel and Ezra determined it's it was critical that the Jews who return to Israel keep their Jewish identity pure. And Zerubbabel, as you read about him, he refused to join efforts with the compromising volunteer workers surrounding Jerusalem. And separation directly resulted in strong opposition, yet the Jewish people had to remain separate and sort of unto themselves, and they eventually com completed the project themselves. Ezra was horrified by the intermarriage of some of the Jews, and he instituted fairly drastic measures to ensure separation from pagan idol-worshiping people. So immediately after their respective arrivals, both Zerubbabel and Ezra led the people in sacrificial worship to sanctify themselves before God prior to rebuilding the temple. And they, they felt that too much of the pagan culture around them and the Babylonian culture had gotten into them and it sort of had infiltrated their Jewish hearts and minds. And I can't think of that without thinking about Paul's words to the Corinthians. So, Tiff, maybe you could read that for us. Yes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, Paul writes, What agreement can exist between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So there's the Apostle Paul quoting there from a passage in Isaiah. And he's referencing that passage to the Corinthian church. He's taking familiar wording which would have been familiar to Jewish believers, and giving it meaning in a fresh context. So just as the Israelites in exile were to put off any idolatry they may have picked up while living in Egypt or living in Babylon, Paul's saying, same thing's true, Corinthian believers. You're to lay aside the idolatry, sexual immorality, whatever that they were steeped in just by virtue of having been born and raised in Corinth. And he says, you've got to be separate from the sin of the world. And therefore, Christians are to separate themselves from any idolatrous thing in our own world as well. 
So that separateness that Ezra, or God through Ezra, calls the Jewish people to, the same thing is true for the Christ follower today. We see Jews being called to separation throughout the Old Testament, and that injunction holds fast for Christ followers into the New Testament. Absolutely. So much to learn from Ezra. Thanks so much for listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Pastor Jeff Cranston. If you're enjoying the podcast, we would love if you would take just a second, leave a rating or a review, especially on iTunes, Apple Music, Apple Podcasts, whatever it's called these days. <laughs> we really do appreciate your help in getting the word out. Don't forget, you can check out today's episode notes and lots more at jeffcranston.com. You can also email us anytime at Pastor or Jeff at lowcountrycc.org. As always, thanks are due to our friends at Low Country Community Church here in Bluffton, South Carolina, and at Streamline Podcast for making this podcast possible. Next week, we will continue with this Bible overview series. We will be jumping back to the New Testament, looking at one of Paul's letters to Timothy. Until then, always remember that the real power of theology is not only knowing it, but applying it. Thanks for joining us at the table. You've been listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Pastor Jeff Cranston. Join us next time for more insights into biblical truth. If you'd like to know more on today's topic, please check out our show notes. If you have a question from today's podcast, kindly email us at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. If you're enjoying this podcast, would you consider leaving a rating and review? We deeply appreciate your help in getting the word out. And be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or in your favorite podcasting app to continue this journey with us as we learn about and apply God's Word to our lives. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here at Kitchen Table Theology.